should be good to go. Yep. All right. Hey, guys. Sorry it took us a bit. Um, we we're trying to get this thing set up. And uh, um, all right. So basically, um, what I'll be, I'm going to be talking about today is uh, something that we did uh, recently at Zalora and something that made us uh, made our life slightly easier. Or, uh, and uh, we basically want to share how we did that in our journey and reasoning with you guys. Right. So basically, this is uh, like the title says <laughs> code generation in Go and uh, how we uh, sort of automated some of our things to, uh, you know, make make it really uh, cool. Um, so one of the nice things about Perl, I think, is uh, these three, uh, this quote by Larry Wall, the creator. He says, uh, good programmers need to be lazy. So uh, I think uh, my colleagues and I are a bit lazy. We were tired of uh, doing the same thing over and over again and decided we'd uh, automate it uh, and, you know, uh, try and uh, do a little bit of code generation. So this is uh, one of my favorite slides. It's, uh, yeah, we can do it, but we also need to tell you why we want to do it, right? Uh, right, so basically, uh, the story starts where, uh, with microservices. Uh, we all know it's awesome. This side is deliberately empty. Um, uh, it's because um, most of us know why we like microservices. They're very scalable. You can work on independent microservices, independent of each other. Uh, you can scale different services uh, independently of each other as well, right? So they are awesome. And uh, the way we structure our microservices is uh, they are uh, reusable uh, by multiple services downstream, which led us to, oops, uh, what to think this. So basically, uh, the pluggable code uh, for the microservices is, uh, you know, abstracted away into SDKs uh, that downstream services can use. Why is why did we do this? Because one, they're reusable. Uh, downstream services can just, you know, plug uh, import the SDK as a dependency and, uh, you know, just call these functions over and over again. Uh, it makes it homogenous. All the SDKs live in one mono repo. Uh, and uh, because they're homogenous and live in a mono repo, it's like very easy to make modifications and uh, distribute these modifications. Um, another neat feature that uh, abstracting away into SDKs is uh, we use uh, protobufs a lot. And uh, because we use SDKs, essentially this proto protobuf code is abstracted away from uh, the client itself into the dependency. So. Uh, this uh, it's so so it's awesome, right? So we've got microservices, we've got SDKs, and we got this. So this uh, was the bit of uh, a jumble that we entered into. Uh, so basically, uh, we had a lot of microservices, and then now we had a lot of SDKs because uh, obviously these microservices were talking to each other, and uh, you know we could put all our code in the SDK. So what happened was. Uh, uh, you see, it's, it's maintenance hell, right? So we've got like about three to four developers, and uh, we really have to keep updating our SDK all the time. We anytime we added a new feature, a new endpoint, we had to update our SDKs. Anytime we added a new query parameter, we should ideally update our SDKs. Uh, and God forbid, imagine we change something. Obviously, we're trying not to be backwards and compatible. But if we change something, then we needed to update our SDKs. So this led to a lot of copy pasting. You know, every time we had to, you know, really write a new endpoint, we'd have to copy the old endpoint, change a very few things, and uh, you know. Uh, and, and then go go for a release. So this this is basically you know a lot of lot of repetitive work and a lot of uh, frustration. And uh, you know also when you copy paste things, you could essentially forget something, and uh, you know uh, that could end up being disastrous for maintenance as well. Uh, before we go uh, f further on on how we did it, let's talk about uh, a few pros and cons of uh, you know um, code generation. I think these. Uh, um, these um, these are general industry uh, um, you know observations on how code generation is and uh, but but this is a very opinionated list right so feel free to uh, disagree or um, you know think differently um, right so uh, 
the good parts of code generation is basically uh, why we wanted it, right? So we don't really have to worry about the boilerplate code. We don't have to constantly keep uh, rewriting the same uh, code that you know we we already know. It's it's boring, right? It's uh, and we're lazy, and, uh, the, and 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 therefore we 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 wanted to automate it. Uh, it also makes our turnaround time fast uh, because we don't have to do this manual work. It's all it's all about just adding. Uh, you know the the one particular point that triggers this generation, and then your build systems will take care of it. You could you could integrate Bazel to it. You could you could you know uh, have a make file that runs this. You could put it on a on, on a CI CD pipeline and have it automatically generate based on certain changes. Right. So um, it's it's very fast. Um, that, those are the nice parts of it. The bad parts, um, you could essentially have code duplication. Uh, if you've seen these, uh, some of these old C++ generated files, you notice that there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of mapping and remapping. Uh, some of the thrift files come to mind. So if you've used thrift, then you notice that generated thrift code is sometimes really, really uh, 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 incredibly, uh, interestingly hard to read. Right, so uh, that's the second point. So um, generated code necessarily isn't always easy. There's a bunch of bytecode baked in. Uh, it's hard to follow. And uh, if you really want to use this, gen this generated code, or you, if you expect someone is going to be reading this generated code, then it's then code generation could essentially be a hassle, right? And we absolutely expected people to read our generated code because the generated code. Uh, I'll show you in a bit on what we intended to generate. So uh, this was important to us. We couldn't have code that was difficult to read or change, right? Um, and uh, also, I think in, in generated code bases, one in, one difficulty is uh, you know really telling apart what is generated and what is not generated. So you, if you want to make changes, you want to really be able to tell which part of code is generated and which part isn't. Uh, this is not too much of a problem problem for Go. Uh, again, I'll show you. Why? Um, but it used to be a big problem for C++ and closure generated codes. Um, right. So the ugly, the really, really bad parts about code generation is uh, generation is like stamping a bandaid into a uh, wound, uh, into a you know a, a battle wound, and, and then and then assuming you have a flesh, it's just a flesh wound. And uh, basically, what what you're gonna do is you're gonna think that your code is okay. And uh, you're going to be fine ignoring it forever because you know generation is taking care of it. So if you have a complex piece of code that generation automates, then it's basically automating the complexity away. So you're generating the complexity away away from your application, and you absolutely don't want to do that, right? So uh, if you think about it, or if you if you look at the slide, uh, you can see uh, it's it's very obvious that the bad and ugly really outweigh the good. So why did we go ahead and do it anyway? Right, so uh, for that, I think it's important to tell, show you how a project is structured. Oops. Right, so uh, this is like a basic skeletal outline of how we structured our SDK. Um, so the client itself is a package. It's basically uh, you know uh, um, the Go HTTP client abstracted out uh, with you know. Uh, wrappers on top of do and a new request. Um, the reasoning here is that we wanted to bake in authorization and retrying logic into it. So the client itself is an abstracted mini client uh, that you know is sufficiently uh, 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 sufficiently self self existing. Um, API.go is basically the specification. It's a set of interfaces where uh, you know if you look at the AWS SDK then they give you a bunch of functions that you can use if you in, in, if you in uh, you know um, uh, use the uh, if you use the constructor to to really construct an, an object and uh, api.go is just a bunch of specifications to do that methods.go is basically where the definition of these specifications go so in c++ speak api.go is sort of a dot h and uh, methods.go is sort of a .c, pp, or .c. So, uh, but regardless, so the API.go is a set of definitions, and methods.go is implementations, and 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 that's where we're going to be doing our generation. The methods.go uh, is going to be the place where we generate code, and and this structure is basically serves as a demonstration on why we think only the positives apply for us and the negatives don't. Um, I'll get to the code duplication in a bit, but we're not essentially abstracting any complicated piece of logic out. Uh, what we're abstracting is this. So if you look at the comment, uh, 
The comment is basically the endpoint, and uh, the code itself is how we abstract the endpoint away. So if I have to give you a brief run through, you just create an operation uh, a struct, and then you use that to uh, you know call a new request. And then uh, there's a bit of a bug here. This, sh this should be nil comma error, uh, but regardless. Um, and then um, you just call the request sent. And uh, if it if it passes, then you just return the details that your struct uh, is uh, that 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 was already defined, right? So if you think about it, the most important. And here is an example of a different endpoint. So if you look at these two, um, you can see that the only things that change are I mean, the only things that stay the same are these two, right? And everything else is basically configuration. So you need to um, essentially write this, or write what the inputs are and what the outputs are, right? And the outputs go here as a response. If there were any inputs, they would be processed. Uh, most of my examples are get. So in this case, they're, they're not present here. And uh, that's basically why we wanted to automate it. If you notice, it's very easy to read. Uh, as a matter of fact, the code that you're looking at is was actually generated uh, and uh, you know therefore uh, it, it doesn't look very hard to read at all it, because it's very simple it does a specific thing uh, it basically is like go to a, an endpoint do this and get this back and send it back right and that leads us to you know uh, a simple observation code generation uh, the way we would intending to do that was simply like building a, a little compiler. Uh, and we were doing this on steroids simply because Go provided us all the tools that we needed, right? So um, maybe a, a quick primer is how compilers work is they're broken down into three steps, right? So you've got the parsing uh, where you, know, you essentially read code that's already written, right? And then you have a, uh, a transformation where you you know change the code into a format that uh, essentially is uh, that's essentially easy to write from, right? And then you finally have the code generation part, which is uh, mostly what compilers do is they optimize this part and then write it to binary so that you know your computer understands it. In our scenario, in our case, this would be to just write more Go code, right? So um, parsing, you know, you can split it as lexical and syntactic analysis. So lexical analysis is basically reading through the code and creating tokens, right? So it knows the keywords, it knows the, um, it knows the uh, primitives, it knows the values you assign to primitives, and it creates a token, uh, a list of tokens on all these values. Uh, syntactic analysis, uh, interestingly, is a sort of transformation already. So basically, uh, syntactic analysis is the part where you convert all these tokens into an abstract syntax tree. So uh, when Go is basically uh, compiling your code, what it does is the first, first there's a Lexer running, right? So the Lexer basically tokenizes all of, all of your code. And then uh, it builds an abstract syntax tree, right? And this abstract syntax tree uh, essentially is a representation of your code, right? And then there's transformation. So transformation, uh, the reason it exists is because uh, compilers, OK, this is not necessarily really relevant to us, but we'll still be doing it. Uh, the reason transformation exists and intermediate representation exists beyond an ESD is so that you can swap in front ends and back ends from your compilers. So modern compilers like LLVM could essentially you know, uh, swap out a CLang uh, front end, uh, back end for a GCC back end. And, and, and intermediate representation uh, allows you to do this. And uh, uh, we, we took advantage of this style of how the compiler works as well. That's the reason why I'm running you through it. And finally, code generation is using this representation to arrive at your desired output, right? So there's an input, uh, there's a process, and there's an output phase, right? So that's essentially how we designed our generator to look like. So the generator was made up of a reader and a writer, right? So the reader would essentially do the parsing, uh, the parsing part of it, and the writer would do the code generation part of it. But where is the intermediate representation, you may ask? And, and that is basically this array. So the API struct is uh, our, our version of an intermediate representation of, this, of, of what we're reading. right? So it essentially, if you look at this definition, you'll notice that it has all the values you need, we need to really 
uh, you know, generate these uh, functions, right? We know what endpoint to call. We we know what method it has to be. If it's, uh, I mean, it's just a name. We know what path to call. Uh, the path and endpoint together would give you the final URL. Uh, we know what ver HTTP verb to use. Uh, so we need to know what if it's a get or a put. In case of a put or a post, you need a body. And then we need to know what input parameters and output parameters the method needs. Right, so essentially, this is uh, in our scenario an exhaustive list of what we needed to really generate the final output. Right, and now, uh, now that we know the, the the working pieces, we wanted to see how we wanted to build each of these independent pieces. So we needed somewhere to read from. We know what to write already. We know that we're going to write into a dot go. We, this is basically what we want to write to. Right. So we, we need to know what to read from. Uh, we, and we already know the intermediate representation as well. So the steps are read from somewhere, put it into an intermediate representation, and write to somewhere. Why we have an intermediate representation is because we want to offer the liberty of changing the reader and writer when, as and when the, if, if someone else wants to modify it. What if someone wants to generate, uh, you know, generate the output as a dot .c to make an ABI? Uh, this would still allow it to do it. The, 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 the way this uh, thing is structured would allow you to do it, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about the reader. So where did where could we essentially you know define the way the application is structured, and you know where can we where could we essentially read from? And uh, we had multiple options. One is uh, Swagger. We could essentially um, um, read uh, from a Swagger specification and then generate our code. Uh, the, the slide itself is very opinionated. Uh, we're not very. I'm not very fond of Swagger. I found it very uh, loopy and difficult to write. So uh, we almost immediately dis dismissed it as an option. Could it be a JSON? This looks nice, right? So if you wanted to maybe create these two functions, then all you had to do was to define what the input parameters were, the structure of the output parameters. Sorry, oops. The structure of the output parameters. And uh, you know you could essentially tell what endpoint and and provide all the details. This could work. This looks nice, right? Uh, but let's look at the third option as well. You could also just define Go interfaces to do this, right? So remember our API.go. So if you could define it by hand, and if you notice, these two have the same details, right? So it's just a different way of representing it. So um, essentially, you could represent the same thing. That's a JSON, but you can represent it in Go itself, right? So what we did, uh, what we could do, is you know define an interface and then represent the functions and the inputs and outputs in the interface, right? And then uh, you know obviously the one downside of doing this is you have to annotate certain values. Like for example, there's no way of representing the endpoint in these functions, right? So that becomes uh, a comment, and then you annotate this uh, function to do that. Right, and uh, yeah, so that's basically these are the three options that we had, right? And and uh, we specifically decided to go with option number three. Um, I'll tell you why. Um, so basically, this is a Go code base, right? So we wanted to keep we wanted to keep all the changes internally to Go. We don't didn't want to uh, so. We knew that the developers maintaining this uh, code base essentially would have to know Go already, right? Because they're going to be reading these methods. There's, there's other parts, components of this code base that that is Go, right? So why not have all of it in Go? We did not want to rely on a on a declarative syntax because that's how JSON seems to be. It it essentially you know transcends into something like HCL. For Terraform, where you know you write a declarative syntax and then it, it gets transferred into something that's entirely different, and we have to write the interfaces anyway. So uh, it made sense for us to uh, uh, rather write the interfaces by hand than generate them from JSONs, right? So that was uh, the reasoning, and we decided you know we just take the interfaces simply because we wanted to keep everything go, right? So. Uh, uh, I know everyone probably knows JSON, but essentially, this they necessarily don't ha they don't necessarily have to know the structure of this JSON. They don't necessarily have to know what the schema is that they have to adhere to, and uh, that is something that we didn't want to be on the cognitive load, and therefore decided to go with uh, most 
what we think is a simpler approach. Right? So that's why we decided we'd go with interfaces. Um, so, so because we got with interfaces, we had an interesting problem to solve, right? So imagine we used JSON, right? So the thing is, we could have solved it with a simple parse, right? So you could just, uh, uh, you know, unmarshal the JSON and then arrive at the intermediate, uh, at the intermediate uh, representation that we had. Um, Unfortunately for us, we decided to go with uh, parsing the Go code, right? And because of this, we needed to look, we really, uh, we had two ways to do it. One was, you know, um, read it line by line using a, buff, uh, a buffer scanner, right? And then interpret every line and, you know, uh, um, use a pre preconceived opinion on, on how a function should be defined to essentially arrive at, at uh, you know, uh, the values that our, our intermediate representation needed. But uh, you see the problem with this, as I say it, right? It sounds so painful, it sounds so opinionated, and it's so not robust at all. So uh, a, more, uh, a more robust way of doing it was to use the AST to parse. Uh, so Go has really, really cool tools that let you do this very, very easily. So it was, it was just a matter, of us, uh, matter for us to you know, uh, uh, import Go AST, Go Parser, and Go Token to do this. Go Parser basically parses it already into an AST. And uh, once you get that, you can just give it a reader or a file name, and it would pass it into an AST. And and once you have the AST, you could essentially, you know, um, uh, loop through it. So Go gives you the tools to uh, walk through to, to to run a walk through the AST, and then you know you can essentially pick out for interfaces, or you know pick out methods, and then pick out their parameters. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's very interesting. And using that, you can uh, build this intermediate representation. So now, now we, um, uh, this was the way we uh, you know, used uh, leveraged AST to build our reader, and then uh, arrived at the intermediate representation. And uh, finally, what, uh, uh, the, the final parts of the code were, sim were basically the easier parts. You just had to convert this intermediate representation into uh, into a final dot go right into into uh, to, to 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 do this right and and that's where we wanted to arrive at and uh, basically initially what we did was it was a lot of uh, format writes or you know string replaces on a, on a file and and that seemed very ugly it seemed very difficult to follow because then all you, you had a lot of string replaces and you like where do i look for uh, uh, you know, where do I look for where I changed a line, right? So we decided to use uh, Go templates, and this seemed to be a really, really neat solution uh, because uh, if you read, if you look at the, if you just look at this template, then it's, it's, uh, in my opinion, not too difficult to arrive at what this template is trying to do, right? It's, it's declaring a function right here. Uh, it, it's adding all the input parameters, adding all the output parameters, and then. If you if you look at this, it's it's calling the operation, and then it's it's basically the same. Uh, it, it it's it's very readable. It's easy on the cognitive load. So we decided we'd use Go templates, and and uh, you know um, this turned out to be interesting, and uh, it's easy to change, easy to maintain, uh, and uh, could work out really really good. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically the the whole end to end of how we did it. Um, there's also a little bit of housekeeping uh, in case someone wants to do this. Uh, these, these notes are basically uh, how we decided to do it. Uh, we decided to put all the generator code in, uh, in the internal package. This seemed to be one of the nicer use cases for internal. I'm not the biggest fan of it. Uh, but uh, this seemed to be a perfect use case for it. The generator would live inside the internal. Um, we'd uh, also obviously expose a command for the generator to run. And uh, the most important thing is to add this directive, this build directive, to the root of your program. So uh, um, our API.go, if you remember our, our, our project structure, would have this right under the package declaration. And this is how Go knows to run the generator. Right. So if you run Go generate, it would look at uh, the it would look at the root to see if it's got the directive somewhere, and the directive would redirect it to your actual generator. And uh, that's basically the final plug, pluggable points um, point for us. Uh, if you want, there's a blog 
as well. Uh, I have uh, more code snippets and, uh, uh, you know, um, there's a bunch of logic as well on how I loop through the AST. Uh, I didn't want to include that today because it seemed a little dry and uh, seemed reasonably easy to understand as well. So uh, if you want more information, it's definitely there on the blog. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I can take them. Virtual pets, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone got questions for Sugasan? So we can post on the Zoom chat or YouTube. Two questions. YouTube. Oh. Two questions, uh, oh, two questions, yes. Okay, I'm yeah. just going to see how I can open well, that. Can you turn on your webcam as well, so you can see you. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> hey, guys. Okay, okay, cool. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate through this thing to bring it. Any... Yeah. Uh, so there's two questions, well, two, two questions from the Syrian. Can you read out the question? All right, uh, so the first question that I'm seeing is uh, how did you parse the comment that access annotation for the URL, correct? Uh, all right, so um, let me answer the first question. So basically, uh, the AST parses it. So uh, that's easy as well. Um, I've, uh, if you look through my blog, then uh, you'll see that uh, it basically parses it into a struct called docs. And uh, then you can. Um, you can loop through this. So basically, what essentially we did was we looped through the docs and added a regex to extract what looked like a HTTP verb and what looked like a URL from the comments. Um, yes, a regex could uh, be a performance penalty. And I think my answer, <laughs> yeah, good old regex pay. And my answer is going to uh, be tied with the second question What about the performance of template generation? So. Um, Essentially, performance is definitely, uh, while we wanted to write very clean code, performance was the last thing on our minds, um, simply because we'd be, we'd be uh, uh, you know, generating code during uh, uh, merge time, right? So when the code is merged, that's when the generation happens. It's never going to happen uh, in runtime or build time even. So anyone who's using this library is already going to see generated code. So the templates and not going to be generated on the fly. They're only going to be generated when we when we, uh, you know, add a new change. So uh, it's sort of like if you used Hugo or Jekyll. It's it's basically like Hugo build or Jekyll serve just before you you deploy it for the first time. And once you build it, you never have to worry about it again until the next build. So. Um, uh, the performance of template generation at this point doesn't seem to be too much of a concern, uh, and it's not. It's not, uh, and I can tell you, it's not um, uh, slow in the sense that I've never had to wait. It's it's like it's it's as, as instant as running go generate and then seeing your methods come out, uh, and and that's also the reason why regex doesn't seem to be a problem for us here as well. One was it was a simple or condition, and two is uh, we're probably only going to generate it every time there's a change to the library itself, and. Uh, uh, but you're right. I think it's something that we could benchmark because essentially what our, our plan is to make it a, a, a monorepo and uh, essentially it could add up. But uh, that's definitely something we could take into consideration. Uh, how about authorization and authentication? Uh, Excellent question. So basically, the reason why you don't see any authorization or authentication in this guide or in this presentation is because um, it's all abstracted away into the client. So uh, the way we did it, uh, if I may say, if I may, uh, is we made a separate interface for authorizer and made it pluggable to the client. Right. So that happens when you do a send request. And it's absolutely abstracted away from. It's a different concern, and you don't necessarily want to be putting it into every method to, you know, to authorize it. So that it, it ended up being a good decision as well, and therefore it, it's it's basically abstracted away into into the client. No problem. Does anyone else have any questions? Anything on YouTube? I'm just going to see if I missed any question. Authentication, authorization, you answer that? Yeah, I answer that. Mm. Any more questions? Yeah. Give it a minute. All right. Um, 
So thanks so much for listening, guys. And uh, feel free to hit me up uh, on my GitHub or... Yeah. Oops. I think it's in the first slide. Sorry, I'm just terrible with slides. Things off, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to put it out, put it out here so you can get it. So if you've got any questions, any more questions, or uh, if you really want to know how to do it, feel free to shoot me something on these accounts. My Twitter's got like about 20 followers, so don't worry about it. Just <laughs> feel free to uh, send me a ping, and uh, should be good. <laughs>